So thanks everyone for being here and uh, yeah, thanks for joining us virtually and let's uh, welcome Kieran. Uh, so Kieran is a PhD student in biostats at the University of Michigan. Um, she is interested in ancient DNA and population genetics. Uh, previously, she worked at the Broad Institute developing methods to detect uh, driver structural variants in cancer genomes. And she has a BA in mathematics from Williams, Williams College and uh, likes to read and write fiction and bike outside in her spare time. So um, yeah, happy to introduce uh, Kieran and um, I'll let you take it from here uh, for your uh, super cool talk. So thanks. Yeah, hi everyone. Thanks so much, Monica, for the introduction and for inviting me um, to give a talk. I um, so I'm going to share some some slides to begin with, and then just to explain and motivate like why um, why I would be interested in doing imputation and what it is, um, and some particular issues think about in ancient DNA, and then I'll go through some of my scripts um, and sort of explain how you would actually do it and what tools you need. Um, so, can people see this? Looks good. Although it's not a full screen yet. Yes. Thank you. Okay. Um, okay. So. All right. So. The sort of motivating factor to do imputation in ancient genomes is that they tend to be low quality. Um, these are sort of precious samples with low amounts of um, endogenous DNA. So most of the, the DNA that's extracted doesn't actually belong to the sort of deceased individual. Um, so because of that, um, so it's really cost effective to do low coverage sequencing. And by that, I mean less than one X. Um, coverage and we have also deamination is an issue um, with C to T um, sort of errors that lead to more issues with genotyping. And so all of these things combined um, you know, we don't have like super high data quality, but we want to answer um, questions about population history and um, what we want. To, we want to be able to use this data and improve its quality so that we can have the most amount of um, power to answer the questions that we're interested in. So basically imputation is a um, tool um, to uh, improve the data quality um, for your genotypes. And basically there are sort of, there are two different data types that are helpful to think about when you think, when you consider imputation. So the first, um, like a SNP array is like the more probably what imputation was developed um, for and originally, which is you have this very um, uh, standard pattern of missingness that's the same in every sample. You have common variants that are population specific that have been genotyped with extremely high quality, um, as you can see here. And then you want to fill in all these question marks of like what the surrounding genotypes are. Low coverage data is a little different in that the pattern of missingness differs between samples and the quality does as well. So that's kind of what the different hues of black refer to is like higher and lower quality um, genotypes. And so low coverage data, you have higher levels of uncertainty about what your genotypes are. So you wanna incorporate this higher level of uncertainty into um, imputation algorithms that um, that were developed that in a considered genotypes to be hard coded because they're just so high quality. Uh, the SNP arrays are really, really high quality in terms of um, the SNPs that they're actually genotyping. 
So the way you do that is you use a hidden Markov model and a external reference panel. I won't really talk about like how that works, um, but you can, um, there's some excellent review papers where you can sort of see uh, more detail how, what the actual method is. Um, but for the purposes of this talk, like why, why would we care about imputing things? Well, basically imputation sort of improves the quality of gene types for low coverage reads, which is this particular, if you have at least one read at a site, you can also call it refinement because it's not like you have completely missing data, but you have some data that's low quality that you're trying to um, increase its quality. And imputation, um, you know, can include refinement and it also maybe specifically, if you think about the array data example, um, it refers to filling in these question marks. Um, so filling in things that you have no reads for. Um, but that's kind of a semantic difference, but something to keep in mind when you are working with your data because that often requires slightly different um, inputs to algorithms to do refinement versus imputation. So, you know, the point is, is we, you know, any kind of downstream analysis you might want to do, you want, um, particularly, I feel like imputation is used a lot in GWAS studies. Um, I mean, this is sort of like generally does not have anything to do with ADNA, um, but, you know, for population genetic analysis, you want Sometimes you want genotype density or like higher genotype density, more power. So this essentially allows you more bang for your buck, right? You're not, when you have one X coverage, you're not even necessarily getting diploid data, right? You only have a read on a maternal or a paternal chromosome. So this allows you to, to have diploid data when you don't have diploid data um, to begin with. So are there any questions? Feel free to interrupt me um, or ask anything um, or you can chat. I'll try and keep track of the chat. So so I, I'm just providing this table of samples. Um, these are ones that I have been working with, um, but for the purposes of the tutorial, um, I may use these or slightly different ones, but I think just to give you an idea of like the kinds of samples I'm been working with. So, um, you know, these are ancient DNA samples. Um, I like to try and I was interested in testing imputation across multiple, um, you know, ancestries. So trying to get um, ancient DNA from, uh, from Africa and, and Europe here specifically. Um, and this is like, ten, you know, um, 8,000 years old, 3,000 years old, 4,500 and, and 7,000. So just to give you an idea of like the kind of scales we're working with, but fundamentally um, imputation will work better if you have samples that are more modern um, because it's gonna match your reference panel better. Um, and something like, you know, the advent of farming in Europe, like your quality of imputation is going to be um, like, you know, if there's like a big event like colonialization, it's going to, it's going to differ. Um, you know, maybe it won't be like necessarily change constantly over time. It depends on like the, the history of the region. Um, so, okay. Just to talk a little about the pipeline. I'm going to, I think most of the ADNA community does Equal in terms of imputation. Um, I also have used Glimpse. Um, Glimpse has a really good tutorial, so I feel like maybe not the best, um, you know, use of time to, to go through Glimpse because it's really well documented. Beagle is a older, so documentation isn't as great definitely exists. So I'm going to talk a little bit about Beagle. Um, and basically, you know, when you're trying to evaluate your imputation algorithm, like the first thing you're going to do is downsample your data. 
Um, I know this is chromosome 20, but I'm doing chromosome one. Um, and for, I won't do the downsampling um, for the purposes of this demonstration, but um, this, like you would only downsample if you're trying to evaluate the quality of your imputation. If you just want to impute something, like clearly you want all the data that you have to begin with. Um, so you're not going to downsample. Um, but the important thing is the thing you have to, the input to the, to Beagle um, and to Glimpse is genotype likelihoods. So that's what you basically, that you need. Um, you know, I'm assuming that like most of the data um, is available in BAM format. So you need to get from BAMs to genotype likelihoods. Then you can input your, um, you, and, and not only that, but you need to do some more filtering because of the deamination, the CTTs um, that I talked about. Um, and then once you have filtered and you have your genotypes that are filtered, you, you can calculate, um, use genotype likelihoods to, um, so this particular pipe is called like two-step imputation. You can go directly from genotype likelihoods to like your imputation output, which basically means like if you don't have any reads, your genotype likelihoods will just assume to be like some sort of uniform distribution. Um, but here, what we're doing is we're first doing refinement, which is we're taking all the places where there are reads and calculating their likelihoods. And then, um, you know, I don't do this particular step, but you can then filter out which genotypes um, you think are you're really confident about using genotype probabilities. And then that's like this GP thing here. And so once you do that, you can treat these genotypes that you've refined as, as like hard-coded and then do um, this genotype, treat it just like regular imputation. You could use Beagle 5 or any standard imputation software really. Um, and then finally you can do post-filtering um, and then you, if you've downsampled, then you can get like, you can compare your high quality data with your downsampled data to get accuracy estimates. Or if you don't have downsampled data, you can just use the estimated R squared, which is this AR2 and DR2 that will, they're slightly different, but they'll give you um, the R squared between your, or the estimated R squared um, of your imputation. So, that's that's pretty much um, the pipeline and also gonna use 1000 genomes as a reference panel. And um, I keep all the default parameters for people, but you can definitely tweak those if you want. Okay, so the tools that I'm gonna be using, I use SAM tools to check coverage and downsample. BCF tools for like just general data wrangling with BCF files. And then GATK's haplotype caller for cloning genotypes. Another option is BCF tools. Um, there's no real reason um, why I'm using GTK haplotype caller, except for the fact that like, it's what I started using in the beginning because this paper that I read used it and I wanted to replicate some of those results, um, but you could e easily use BCF tools. Um, and then Beagle 4.1 for refinement, which is sort of just doing imputation on just the subset of reads that you have. So a subset of um, uh, you know, base pairs that are covered by reads. And then 5.0 for once you treat those genotypes um, that you have at least one read of evidence for as hard-coded, and then you um, impute everything in the reference panel, basically. Okay. Are there any questions before I like show you some of my code? I guess I have a question. Um, is there any reason that you, why you use GATK instead of something like Atlas that works with um, ancient DNA data and you can incorporate, you know, the impact of deamination? Um, yeah, that's a good question. I mean, I think, yeah, I think Atlas is, is 
like ideal in some ways because it does incorporate deamination. I think personally, Atlas isn't super well supported in terms of like um, if you have issues with it. Um, I think GATK has a really sort of robust system for you to like, they have like a forum and everything. So I think it was easier for me to get started with GATK because it just felt, I remember trying Atlas and running into issues and then being like, oh no, like where, who do I go to for this? Um, so it was kind of more practical thing. Um, but you can also do the deamination filtering yourself using BCF tools. So you don't, and you know, the results I'm getting are like comparable to, to published work. So I think, I think at the end of the day, it probably makes a very marginal difference. Okay, thanks. I was just wondering. Um, yeah, thanks for the question. That was a good question. Are there any other questions? Okay, so I'm gonna share my code. So I do, I mean, you're working with whole genome sequencing, so you have to use uh, or the, the cluster basically. So I work through the terminal. Um, can everyone see my screen? Looks good to me. Maybe is there a way to make the font a little bigger? It is fine for me, but I don't know if, if I can. Maybe make that would help. Font. Yeah. Okay. Let's see, is that better? Yeah, I think that that improves it. But if anybody has any issues, just just uh, speak up. Uh, but it it looks good. Okay. So. Okay. So I basically just have, you know, I use Tmux because, so this is already logged into Tmux and I use that um, just so like if I shut my computer, like the process is still gonna run, um, you know, if I need to run overnight or if my computer dies or something like that. Um, but yeah, feel free to interrupt me anytime, questions. Um, I'm just going to show you. So the first thing that you want to do is you want to figure out like where your sample is. Um, so I'm actually going to share something different um, here. But so for instance, some of the samples that I was interested in were published in this study um, about ancient African foragers, which is super cool. And most of these a DNA papers have like their sample information. Uh, if you look at the data availability and then, can you still see my screen or not? No, okay. Wait, I see, yeah, I don't see your terminal. I just see memory. Okay, let's see. Let's just share the desktop, maybe that's easy. Um, but it took me to, uh, can you see this? The ENA nucleotide? Yes. So it takes you to um, this website, and this is pretty standard, where it like tells you details of the study, that has all your samples, then you can download them. So you just like, I pick some samples um, based on like their, their coverages or like how high quality they were and um, what, what, you know, time frame they were, things like that, but, you know, you'll, you'll know which in samples you're interested in. So I just copy the link and, um, I go back to the terminal and I have like a data folder, all my files. Um, so then I'll just do, we get like, this sample. Um, and I've already downloaded it, but it doesn't take too long. Um, usually, depending on how um, how how high the coverage is. One thing I would say um, is that uh, one thing I learned with experience is to be really careful about checking, sort of, to make sure that when you download your sample, it's like exactly what 
you thought it was, like in terms of the sample name and um, the coverage. So uh, I'm just gonna stop this because it might take a little bit, but the, the idea here is that you basically want to download all your samples and then you wanna check them out. So um, I have, the way I keep my scripts um, is that I chop, at least to start with, I chop them up into like the discrete tasks that they represent, it's just easier to keep track of. And also I can uh, find them easier. And, you know, oftentimes I don't necessarily want to run my whole pipeline. I just want to run a step of it. Uh, so it just keeps everything in a more manageable stage. So I have a, um, a bash script for, um, checking my data. So I called it something like data. So I'll just show you like how I would go about checking um, the data that I have. So SAM tools is pretty good for this. Um, I would just, I just create a for loop where I list out all the samples that, you know, like I care about um, and they have, like they have a similar name. Um, so they have like a name and then this dot 40K dot BAM. So I can just, plug in this name here, look at um, the top of the header, see like, um, so for instance, if I run this um, script, I just run it locally and bash. Um, oh, I see. So basically I had just did specify the file correctly, um, but you can see that I'll show you what the header. So I didn't open the header here, but I will do that shortly. But since it's already doing this, um, what I basically am doing here is checking the coverage of the file. So I did, there's like a SAM tools coverage command. Um, and you specify the region of your command, um, sorry, the, the region of the genome that you want to uh, look at. So here is like the output and uh, you can see like, basically it tells you like what part of the genome is looking at, number of reads, number of covered bases, coverage, the so mean depth. So coverage um, didn't um, necessarily find all these files and may have moved them. But, you know, you can see up here that like the coverage is, um, it doesn't actually mean mean depth. Like this is not 42 X. This coverage means like 42.8% of the um, bases are read essentially um, or covered by reads. Um, so just keep in mind that doesn't actually mean they're different sort of different ways of reporting coverage and coverage means like percent bases covered. And then mean depth is just like 1.4 X here. And then um, you can see that I have some downsample BAMs where I'm just checking whether the coverage was like what I thought um, it was when I downsampled it. But for purposes of today, I'm not gonna downsample the BAMs, um, but you can see like, this is how you would check um, check your coverage. And then you'd wanna, um, so you'd also want to do this. Uh, just check the uh, headers. So um, you know, let's just pick some some sample that I have. So it just basically shows me like, oh, okay, um, these these are all the different like regions. So let me, if I do like 
first 10 lines, you can see it's like all the different chromosomes and length. Um, and then it'll tell me um, like what the, the, the names of the, um, the sequencing, like it was sequenced by Illumina, it'll be here in the header. Up, and um, it should also tell me the sample name. Um, so, yeah, the information is all here in the header. Um, but so you can just do do some sanity checking to make sure it's like the sample that you the correct sample. Um, So yeah, that's that's pretty much what you would do or what I would do to check um, sort of the quality of your of the coverage. And you oftentimes you'll find that it's not necessarily exactly what's in the reported tables because a lot of samples are are covered. Um, excuse me, a lot of samples their coverage is calculated using genome-wide um, SNPs that have been hybridized. So they're not uniformly genome-wide coverage. It's like high coverage just for those SNPs. So your coverage, the whole genome-wide will be less um, because a lot of, I mean, I think 70% of samples are um, sort of enriched using this hybridization uh, capture. So you just want to kind of be aware of that. And I think like a, probably a, a more, this is something I need to update my pipeline for, but, you know, is instead of downsampling the whole um, genome, you kind of want to downsample just those SNPs that have been hybridized. Um, but, um, you know, for the purposes of just getting things to run, like sam downsampling, like the whole genome is, is fine. Okay, so, after you kind of make sure that your samples are what you think they are, um, are there are there any questions about that actually before I before I go on? Um, I guess my question is if the samples are not what you think they are, you said that these are like kind of precious, so it doesn't. It's just for the purpose of like correcting like the data that you have about them, like you wouldn't exclude them, right? Like you would just kind of find a way to work with them. Like what what would you do if sort of like the data downloaded is wrong? I'm just kind of curious. Yeah, so I've never had a problem that like a sample um, wasn't like, didn't have the correct name or something, but um, I guess if it's not what you think it is, I get I was more talking about, um, like the name of the sample or something it's like it's actually a different sample or um it's not the one that you know they said so i think it's just kind of it probably just got mislabeled or something then you need to go back and like contact the authors and be like oh what you put on your website wasn't like exactly correct or you know sometimes these mistakes happen so um i think yeah i think you know we don't have to discard anything it's just more about like making sure the ID of your sample is like what you think it is. And then um, the coverage of your sample is like, um, you know, you would have to use the, the SNPs that they use specifically for the hybridization to double check that the coverage is what they reported in the table. Um, but, but, but things like that, um, where if something wasn't quite right, you'd probably wanna go back to the authors and ask them. Um, yeah, but that's a good question. Thanks. Okay, is there anything else? All right, well, okay. So now I'm gonna talk about how you calculate genotype likelihoods and kind of like the fact that um, something brought up earlier, 
Uh, there are multiple ways to do this. Like you could do this in Atlas and that is definitely um, definitely what I've seen a lot of ADNA papers. Um, it, it works reasonably well in GTK too, um, or you could use BCF tools. Um, so I think, yeah, I think there have been some, or like there was paper like describing um, like the effect of using different genotype callers and honestly, they all look pretty similar. So I think, you know, there are probably some small differences, but you'd probably be okay anyway, you wanted to do this. Um, so I'm gonna show you my script for genotype likelihoods. Um, okay. So this is something that I send to the um, to the cluster because G, the the one downside of GTK is it is much more time intensive because it does save a copy of every single position on the genome even if there isn't a read there, um, and I think you know it makes it easier to merge merge files and stuff and eventually once you do the genotype calling it'll just be like a normal VCF but it initially creates this GVCF format, which is like really big and it just takes forever. Um, so that's definite downside of GTK tools. Um, and probably my preferred choice to do this would be BCF tools, but there's also something to be said just to have something that works and is accurate. Like, um, you know, you don't necessarily um, need to worry about um, like optimizing your pipeline, like the first time you create it. Um, and as long as it runs in like a reasonable amount of time, I think like it's generally okay. Um, so what I'm gonna do here is, so I use Slurm to, to go to the cluster and to tell me like, what I want the job name to be, how much memory, how many CPUs, this kind of, um, the time limit. I I basically pulled this from just like um, dip from from like an example on uh, of Slurm and like what memory and CPUs they used or um, and so there's no like real um, there's more of like trial and error to determine like what the memory is and the CPUs I want. Um, not necessarily something super rigorous, uh, but, you know, so I have a lot of stuff that's been commented out here, but but the, the important thing here is um, you basically want the main, the main thing you want to do is first you need to um, make sure that you're, so kind of what, you know, um, Monica asked about like, what do you do if like, um, the files aren't quite what you think you are. Well, one thing that can happen is not that they aren't what you think you are, but they don't have like a sample um, name that uh, in in the SAM tools header um, that is like uniquely identifiable. So if you wanna merge the file, then it's gonna think every single file is the same name. So either you can change that in SAM tools, which is like what this part of the code is here. So I'm changing it directly in SAM tools. Um, I feel like that, that did work the first time I tried it, but then I had issues. So I actually prefer now to use, so this would be, um, this step here would be the main, uh, the main sort of input to get the, to get GATK to do, um, to calculate genotype likelihoods. Um, so you haplotype type caller. I put in like a reference genome. So these are aligned to um, HG37. Um, and then input and output file names, and then you just sort of run it. I'm not gonna run it because it takes forever, um, but there's really good documentation on the GTK website as well. Um, and mm -hmm. so well, one thing I like to do is like here, you can see I changed the headers like in the VCF using VCF tools. Um, so I take my sample names. Um, 
I basically create this header text file, which basically says like what um, I want the header to be or the sample name to be. Um, so I create it just in dash and then I reheader using this text file and the text file is created for every single sample. Um, it just writes um, writes over it and then I and then I have my output in VCFs and then I can merge those VCFs together um, to create um, one uh, to create some VCFs that have unique sample names therefore I can um, merge them pretty easily. So the way that you would merge them is you also would use uh, VCF to, or sorry, GATK um, tools. So I have a script where I combine them and I basically, first you need to create an index file. Um, I sort, then I list all the file names and then I, that creates a list of all the files I want to merge. And then I just merge them with combine um, GVCFs, and then I um, I genotype them here. So um, yeah, so I think that's pretty much it. I mean, this this part is pretty fast, um, and I still I, I guess I still have been running this in. Um, on the cluster, I find like if just anything takes longer than a few minutes, I'll just run out in the cluster. Um, but yeah, I mean, again, I think um, I'll just sort of um, not run this now, um, mostly just because it takes time. But I think that's kind of how you would get your genotype likelihood. So that's the input for imputation. Are there any questions about that? Sorry, I have a quick question. Um, yeah. I saw that it looks like you filter for transversions only. Um, have you tested to see like trimming the ends of reads to get rid of deamination instead of doing tran transversions only? Or I was just wondering what, yeah, if you've seen the impacts of that or you just decided to yeah, to be as conservative as possible, which makes sense, and just do transversions only. Yeah, thank you. That's a really great question. Um, I, yeah, so I did, I do have, um, so yes, there was a filtering step there. I actually ended up just creating a, a little script that filters, um, so I can um, show you that. And that was sort of my next second anyway, so it's a good segue. Um, but yes, yeah, so I, I only do transversions um, because yes, like you said, trimming the ends of the reads does, I felt, I was just worried like it was gonna lose too much information that way. Um, and I felt, I haven't, I haven't tried trimming ends of the reads. I think honestly, I kind of left, left like, this sort of data cleaning kind of um, as an optimization step I'd want to do maybe like down the line, but fundamentally like uh, I think in terms of like the focus of my thesis was more on, is more on um, like imputation, like meta imputation algorithms. So I think I was kind of like, you know, I'm gonna park that for later. Um, but yeah, I think, you know, fundamentally, I, I think it definitely, so there are some, there's some papers that sort of say like, don't, don't filter for deaminated variants, because that's like, if you look at imputation results, um, it ends up like reducing your accuracy because you're losing information. But I think like those papers, they were filtering out every single C to T transition, which seems like way too, um, liberal. So I, yeah, I think you're absolutely right that there are meaningful differences. And um, I think that's sort of an optimization step for the pipeline. Um, but yeah, I think my my initial, my initial um, instincts were kind of, as you said, that I wanted to be more conservative. And 
So I, I only ended up filtering um, C to T's that, you know, had a low quality. And um, at one point I was even doing like low uh, allele frequency ones. Um, so, uh, and then, you know, one way to check, like aside from imputation um, accuracy, like whether what you're doing is reasonable, you can check like the TS to TV ratio. Um, and so I have, found so if I run this this one is pretty fast um so um so I'm basically just doing my filtration steps and then calculating the TSTV ratio so um for nothing you know I haven't filtered anything I have like you know 3.23 and then if I have after I filter for deaminated variants I have um 3.07, and these are just like the variants themselves that got filtered out. So I think part of the reason why it's still so high is because of this sequencing that I was talking about hybridization is I, it's like, we're not really having uniform coverage, you know, across the genome. Cause like the transversion to transition or the TSTV ratio can, can change across the genome. I think we're probably getting a lot of regions in exomes um, that tend to be the higher transition transversion ratio because of the CPG islands and um, sort of more conserved regions. Um, so, I mean, you also want to be sort of think about like what regions are you actually capturing in terms of your data and then what would be your expected TS to TV ratio. And then you can kind of use that as a guide to um, for the filtration. Um, but I think um, part of part of the fact that my ratio is still like three, I think it, you know, some of it might be, I just haven't removed anything. Um, and partly that's because I'm being conservative, so. Yeah, I think that makes total sense. I was just curious if you played around with it and yeah, thank you. Yeah, no, no, it's an important thing to consider definitely. Um, Yeah, and I think people do, you know, one more comment is where people do different things, like sometimes not necessarily because one is better than the other, but just because they're like used to some things over other things. Um, so you'll see, I feel like I found different papers have different strategies, um, but that seems more like an intrinsic quirk rather than something that's been optimized. Um, so, yeah. Uh, okay, so the the next step is to like prepare your um, let's see, okay, prepare your. So I'm gonna try and go through this a little quickly because I feel like maybe we don't have too much time. So one thing you're gonna have to do is um, is is I'll skip this step. Um, you know, in terms of my code, but you have to at least for most ADNAs aligned to HG19. I found so. You, Reference panel, 1000 genomes is HG38. So you have to do the liftover process. And then another thing you need to do is split your files. So, you know, it's a lot easier to get your work done in the cluster if you have a ton of small files like they don't get blocked up in the queue. Um, because if you just do one huge file, like that might get like, because it takes up a lot of um, memory, it might just get sort of, pulled down to the queue. So one way to kind of jump the queue is get like a lot of tiny files. Um, so I split up my files um, and and then you know I I I do the the imputation on 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 this on each single segment. So that's something that's my prep beagle step. Um, but let me just get to the imputation. So here I'm doing this on uh, my on the cluster we have at University of Michigan. And so I've basically, um, well, this this for loop would be if I'm not running it on the cluster, but here, um, if I comment this out, you can see like, this is Beagle, it's a Java program. You can download it, um, publicly available. 
And then I just enter in like my genotype likelihoods, the chopped up files, like each, each small file. Um, and so genotype likelihood input is just a VCF with the genotype likelihood um, variable in it. And then I have my reference genome, which is a thousand genomes. I cleaned it by removing biallelic SNPs and or, sorry, by only keeping biallelic SNPs. And then um, then I sort of have this each segment. Um, I have my output and then I need one thing that's important is you need to specify the window um, start and end points because you don't want it to impute the entire chromosome for this one tiny segment, right? It's not going to do very well outside um, as you go far and farther away from the segment. Um, and so you only want it to impute like within that window. So I kind of grab the start and end of the file here. And then I do the imputation or so this would be refinement, right? Technically speaking, um, some people use refinement imputation um, interchangeably, but this is just only stuff where I have reads. And then the imputation is I treat this, these genotype likelihoods as hard coded. Um, once they're refined, I treat them, the genotypes as hard coded. And then I create um, the imputed files um, the, and the imputed files um, are the length, roughly the length of the reference panel. Um, so, but now I have all these little, little files, right? So I need to ligate them. So here's an example of my ligation script. I, um, I basically create a list of all the samples. Then I use BCF tools to concatenate do the same thing. I wanted to compare imputation and refinement specifically here. So that's why they're two separate um, ones. But if you only care about the end imputation results, only use imputation. Um, so these are just some quality checks. I just make sure they're, you know, I just pick some random position. And then I was having some issues with duplicates in the beginning as I'm, um, made sure things aren't duplicated. And then one, important quality metric is marker count. So your reference panel in marker count should be, I can run this really quickly, but pretty fast. Um, um, your reference panel marker count should be more than your imputed marker count. Um, and you your um so refinement you should have your refinement um the number of refined markers should be you know equal or less to the number of starting markers so you start with some markers refinement you know you'll have less than or equal to that and then you use a reference panel to impute and the imputed results you should have less than or equal to the number of markers in the reference panel um so that's a really quick and easy quality check you can do um at the end of your imputation and hopefully this doesn't take too long, but um, yeah. So I'm just gonna show you what the, the final results look like. So if I go to um, uh, so here's like my file, chromosome one impute beagle. So I just do, Z less to open it. Um, I like to date my files. It makes things a lot easier to figure out like when I, um, oh, I think it overwrote this law and then I stopped it. So let me show you a slightly different one. Um, 0208. So this is what it will look like. Um, you have a VCF file with your chromosome position, um, reference alternative allele, and then you'll have these like quality metrics, these R squared quality metrics, allele frequency, whether or not your sample was imputed or not, sorry, the, sorry, whether your marker was imputed or not, or whether it was a marker that, marker that was originally there. So most of your markers should be imputed. Um, and then you have like the genotypes themselves and the probability. Um, of your genotypes. Um, yeah, so I think that's that's pretty much it um, for for Beagle. Um, 
it takes like maybe a couple couple hours to run um, in the cluster. So um, yeah, thank you so much and for your attention. I'm happy to take any questions. Awesome, thank you so much, Karen. Uh, and thanks so much for sharing uh, all your scripts and your workflow. This is, I'm sure, really a really good resource uh, for, for the top 10 and Asian DNA community. So uh, thanks again. And yeah, we are basically at time. So um, if people have to go, um, that'll be uh, that'll be fine, and I'm sure um, you know we can also reach you through email, etc. But if anybody wants to just ask anything uh, really briefly, um, if you have a couple minutes, I'm sure that'll be okay. But yeah, otherwise, thanks so much, and thank you so much for for presenting.